Thanks for tuning in to the Animal Control Report podcast, where we help debunk the dog catcher stereotype. A lot of times people think it's the dog catcher when they hear about animal control officers. But here on the Animal Control Report, we change that by taking you inside the day-to-day operations of animal control officers. Not only will you hear stories of animal control officers, but you'll hear from industry experts as well. We are also part of the Keep It Humane podcast network. We have some amazing partners there, so check them out at keepithumane.com forward slash podcast network. You can listen to all the animal control and animal welfare related podcast there. And let's continue to help people help animals. Oh, I have to do this. Welcome to the animal control report with your hosts, Ashley Bishop and Ashley Bishop. And I am your other host, Daniel Ettinger. You know, what's great about this video that we do this zoom. What? Well, I guess you could watch it on Spotify or YouTube is both bishops are diagonal right now. And it's perfect. Oh, really? Because I'm, I'm on top of her on mine. What are you talking about over there? <laughs> it well, shows up differently for everybody, Dan. No, but on the recording, it'll be accurate. And you'll have two bishops, one diagonal from the other. That's so, because we have to surround you to keep you in check. Agreed. Well pun. Well played pun. <laughs> well played pun. So guess what I'm not doing right now? Not moving. Well, no, I moved. I'm not traveling. This is the okay. first oh. time. <laughs> In five I was gonna say working in five weekends <laughs> that I haven't been on an airplane. It feels wild. That's Dude. crazy. Yeah, it was that was too much. I'll be honest. That was I I bet. Yeah. I'm sure Mooney is appreciative of you not moving or traveling. He is uh he's appreciative. He just took his little bone and now he's gonna go and chew on that for a little bit. So good boy. Maybe he didn't miss you. It's okay. He probably didn't. He had great uh, care. He had great rovers and um, great. Uh, my name, one, my shout out to my old neighbor, Susan. She was lovely. She had a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, oh. and uh, he was old. His tongue stuck out of his mouth because he couldn't yeah. like. He had no teeth, uh, but I would watch him quite a bit because she traveled too, and uh, she would always take care of Mooney. So a big help there. Speaking of travel, speaking of travel, now this episode will air hmm, like just a little bit after the new change with the CDC. Do y'all know where I'm going with this? You know what I'm talking about? I actually don't. So the CDC is making changes to dog imports into this country. Oh, interesting. Starting August 1st. Yeah, it's really interesting. And you can go online. You can check it yourself. But the big things, here's the big takeaways. Okay. Just bullet point. And this is from, uh, again, from the CDC. And I'm pulling this directly from AAHA, their website. What is that? American. I don't know what that stands for. Does anybody know what that stands for? AAHA. Animal Hospitals Association. Yep. That's the one of America. Man, you're good. I, it, it, it's almost like you're a vet tech. Oh, I mean, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> In life, once ago. <laughs> all right, here's the changes. All dogs, all dogs must be at least six months old. Again, all dogs must be at least six months old to enter the U.S., even if they're coming from a rabies-free country. So before, they had some parameters, depending on countries that were considered mm-hmm. low rabies and some that were considered high. So now you have to have dogs that are at least six months old. That's wild. But this is good, in my opinion. This is really good. All dogs must appear healthy upon arrival. All dogs must be microchipped regardless of the country of origin. The the microchip must be detectable with a universal scanner. I struggle with that one. How come? Talk about it. Because... Great, it's detectable by a universal scanner, but does right. that mean we're actually going to reach somebody that Traceable. can give us any information? I agree. We've had a lot of issues with overseas microchips, particularly UK and Mexico chips. I mean, they're so hard to trace. They are hard to trace. Now, however, that being said, though, however, they're... it's it's all. Think about it this way. It's. Even even if it's not traceable, it's a record for that dog. So that chip will always be, it's almost like having a social security number for that dog. 
So now we know that dog is, when it comes in and all the paperwork's done, we know that dog is related to that chip. So, but how do, but how do we change the information on the chip? You can't. Most, I don't know. Just be happy that the CDC did something. Okay. 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 Most, most organizations will do it for you, regardless of the chip manufacturer. So, you know, Home Again, Avid will, will take on that chip, regardless of who, who made it or whose information. Well, and it would be nice too, because I know that there are some third party um, websites and stuff out there that actually will just let you register chips, even if it's not through the microchip company. Mm -hmm. So it'd be really nice if the animals coming in that have these overseas chips would just get put into those systems too, just so that somebody locally has it. It does also say this includes ensuring that each dog has a working microchip. So uh, maybe there's there's some regulatory. Working doesn't always mean. Oh, registered. my goodness. Bishop. Just <laughs> let gonna, it go. I was going to say the same thing, too. For the record, I was on the debate team as well in high Clearly. school. <laughs> That's why you're on this damn podcast. <laughs> <laughs> How are things in both Bishop lands? Good. Um, weather's kind of strange here in Texas right now. We've been getting a lot of water, <laughs> lots of rain, which is interesting for this time of year. Usually it's hotter than, I'm not going to say it on this podcast, but you know, it, it's generally pretty hot. Not that it's not hot, but um, yeah, uh, I'm going to do some training this coming week via Zoom. So I'm excited for that. Something new for me, TCCI. Um, that stands for, because only two of us on this show right now are from Texas. So. <laughs> Uh, Texas Certified Cruelty Investigator course. So oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. That so, uh, uh, no, this is through Taka, but oh, Taka. Dr. Yeah. Draper, um, Dr. Draper from Corpus Christi. Oh, cool. And Ashley, I will be on that as well. Oh, nice. Well, then I will see you then. Yes. <laughs> Do we have to keep our cameras on the whole time? I'm yeah. a little concerned. Okay. Why are you concerned, bro? I got a lot of dogs and a lot of kids and it's so we're okay funny. with that this is a family oriented podcast for those of you wondering if you're not watching on zoom right now or i keep saying zoom on youtube or what's spotify, the other? spotify. Hey, it's, it's early out here that's shelby baboski she is joining us today she's our guest and she is the executive director of the texas humane legislative network don't get it confused people I'm trying to say this as many times as possible because they're listening. I know they're listening. I did not I did not mess it up. It and she is not the executive director of the Texas, the Humane Educators of Texas. <laughs> Those are two different people. Those are we love them. Shout out. By the way, Dan, I told you I was right. About Tabitha is the rabbit tabby. Queen? And is the rabbit tabby like, hell yeah yeah she is uh something else we'll say that we <laughs> mad that i moved away from san diego but she won't be too mad because i didn't move too far so we'll see when you i get can there. travel back there with her yeah it's only like an hour 45 minutes six hours with traffic but that's fine shelby shelby thanks for joining us we are excited to have you question can you let our listeners know who the hell you are? Because they're like, what? <laughs> who is Shelby Baboski? That's a great sure. name. I love saying that, Baboski. I wish you were on this show full time because I would just be like, Baboski, go. Yes, Baboski, <laughs> go. Uh, so I uh, am an attorney by trade and I was a trial attorney for about 15 years and I started to get into animal issues when I was exposed to a puppy mill that was about 20 miles from my house. And I could not believe like this tiny house had 500 plus dogs in it. Um, it was just insane. And my first question was, how is this legal? So uh, <laughs> from that point, I met Skip Tremble and he was with Texas Humane Legislation Network passed a ton of animal laws and I learned about THLN and I joined the board and then the rest is history. Uh, we, we had some difficult, difficult sessions with something called the safe outdoor dogs act. And we had to just keep going back. Um, and then the governor vetoed it. And then it was the first animal bill that was brought during a special session. 
like in the history of the Texas legislature. So he brought it back and he actually passed it. And was well, that the, was, was, is that the, the tethering law or is that something? Yeah. Different? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we, we uh, renamed it there because, uh, you know, we had tried unsuccessfully two other times to pass it. And it was truly this one legislator that just kept using procedural tactics to mm. kick it out. Can I um, ask just really quick, because we have that in California. Yeah. How is it enforced in Texas? Great question. So we have in Texas a lot of counties that cannot pass their own ordinances okay. um, because of the home rule. And okay. so really it was the sheriffs and a lot of rural ACOs that were coming to us saying, will you please do something about the current tethering law that they had? It was unenforceable. Um, it was terribly written, if I may say that. We didn't write it. What happens sometimes is you have a law, excuse me, a bill that goes through the legislature and then people add on things and remove things. And then nobody was really watching it. And it came out to be a, a really, really bad law. So we went in and fixed it. But in the rural areas, it's working wonderfully. Okay. Um, I will tell you that sheriffs, I just was at the Texas Sheriff's Convention and uh, I was giving big hugs to some of the rural sheriffs that said, thank you for passing that. Because I was so sick of seeing sad chain dogs on trees. Um, so they gave them new, you know, the the aerial tethers. They gave them dog houses. And it's really probably been one of our most successful laws that we've ever had a hand in. I don't know. Say, Ashley, what do you think being just uh, really, from your area? Yeah, but really quick, Bishop, aerial tether. Are you talking about a, a trolley line? It's It can be a trolley. It just can't be a chain. Okay, our correct. whole thing with chains was if it's thick then it's too heavy yeah. and if it's a smaller chain it would rust and break okay. um which we were hearing stories you know from sheriffs left and right on that so yeah but we've we felt it's really helped people for example courtney burns she's the spca um cruelty investigator in east texas and she's like i really thought that a lot of sheriffs and their deputies would totally hate this but they actually really are using it because what happens daniel you have a sheriff's deputy that goes out to a house, you have the neighbor that complained and before the law passed, he would leave the house and nothing's changed and the dog is still chained. And then they'd be mad at law enforcement, right? Yeah. Because they'd be like, why didn't you help this dog? So now they actually can enforce it. So it's, it's working what we've heard. What, can you go into a little bit more depth as to what the, the law itself is? Sure. So wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we we literally have a subject matter expert down here that probably can talk. I want to hear it from ACO Bishop. No disrespect to Baboski, but I need to hear it from her viewpoint because this is her team. This is this affects them on a day to day. Plus, Shelby also set her up, and then I interrupted. So now I have to <laughs> you, Bishop, to get us back on track. No, for sure. Um, so when we found out that all of this was kind of hitting um, our legislator, we actually started um, campaigning for it so the community was very aware. Um, and it was great, too, because uh, THLN did great about setting up all of what was necessary, what, you know, you could do, what you couldn't do, great infographics in both English and Spanish. Um, and we had a lot of people actually calling in and saying, hey, is this allowed, is this allowed? Um, and, and it was great for us over overall. Um, I think on our end, it, it's worked out really great. You know, we've been able to give out a lot of dog houses, um, trolley systems and things like that. Um, and, you know, overall, it, it's been a fantastic thing for us to use um, to educate people on what's proper and what's not proper. Um, but yeah, for us, it's been working out pretty great. What is it? <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> like, I literally have nothing up here that's like an outside dog is an outside dog and it can be tethered and I have nothing to do. As long as it has proper well, shelter. I will say, say, I'm doing this intentionally just to lead you on. Uh, I'm going to make you suffer and wait. I think it's necessary from a behavioral, not just, not just the animal welfare aspect of it all, mm -hmm. of it maybe being cruel and inhumane, but 
from the behavioral if a dog is left out on a chain. Uh, there's a study that I use in, in a class that really tries to identify cruelty towards animals and, and dangerous people that creates an environment where dogs now become behavioral issues because they're exposed and, and around that. And the leading, one of the leading causes of, of fatalities uh, are from dogs that are chained up. Uh, oh, and I don't disagree one bit. It's just, there's a lot of pushback here in the state because of um, all the especially cows. the rural areas and farm dogs and stuff. What? I said all the cows. Oh, Show what is it? I'll be real quick. Um, so basically, it, it's as simple as this. If you're gonna, you are allowed to tether a dog 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you have to meet certain requirements. You have to have a dog house. You can't use a chain. It has to have food and water. And also, you have to allow an ACO to be able to make a decision because in Texas, when it's um, 100 plus degrees mm -hmm. and you see a dog that's suffering, you want to be able to have enforcement like that. What was happening is with the previous law, it said it was just you would always give a warning. Mm -hmm. So and you could come back 24 hours later. It was ridiculous. You know, why are we making our ACOs waste our, their time like that? So it really, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what it does is it tells the community, just like Ashley said, exactly what they can and can't do and how they can tether their dog. And then it gives, um, you know, another tool in the toolbox for our ACOs and law enforcement, especially rural sheriffs to um, be able to remove the dog if necessary. They don't want to. And it's all about education. There were, you know, certain um, areas of Texas called me and said, we're not going to enforce this for nine months because we got to get our community used to it. Smart I said, though. go for it. Yeah, you, you have prosecutorial discretion. You know your community better than us. Um, but then that same sheriff called me about a year after it passed. He goes, I cannot tell you what this has done for our community. So yeah, it's good. And Ashley and I, we did not practice that. I had no idea. She could have said, this law sucks. <laughs> but, so that was great to hear that she actually, it's working for them. So No, yeah, for sure. And, and sorry, OG Bishop. Yeah. So, so essentially, too, for us, it, it, it gave a little bit more explicit definition for what is considered ad adequate shelter, because I feel like everywhere, not just here in Texas, but everywhere, you know, it's so different. You know, some people are like, well, it's got a roof, so that's fine. You know, that theoretically, no, it's really not. So uh, I think it just sets precedence for everybody at a state level to have this regulation. Um, and then we can even just make it stronger. So, you know, for, for us locally. Um, but yeah, so adequate shelter, restraining, um, for any kind of inclement weather and things like that. Because again, here in Texas too, we've gotten some crazy weather. People don't know what to do with their animals when it's freezing or snowing out. Um, so it gives us the strength to make sure that people are paying attention to how their animals are being housed outside. I really like that. That was one thing that um, it, it, somebody, and, and I think it was just kind of a grassroots group in the area was trying to, do some anti-tethering laws and <clears throat> what they wanted was you know can't be out for more than an hour unsupervised on a tether and I'm, unrealistic and, yeah no, well, really. how do you enforce that right gotcha. yeah so i like the option of all right you want to have an outdoor only dog or whatever you can but i like that and i think what's important is making it making it something that is enforceable in a realistic manner and i can speak to the one that we had uh in denver was you know it, it basically if the animal is on any sort of tether and then there is like a concern or risk to it whether it's um you know wrapped around a tree too tightly or can't access food water or shelter then it's enforceable it makes it easy that way um the time aspect it just having a tethering law specific to time is almost mm -hmm. impossible to enforce because no one has the resources to sit there and just just you know monitor the dog for a whole hour or whatever it may be to ensure that um, it's violating or the probable cause is there so that's great well, stuff yeah. and also imagine this so the time limit comes up so it's three hours 
all the person does or one hour or whatever, just they just bring the dog back in, take it out and start it over. I so know. Right. I, I'm telling you, this was a, this was a law. I've been doing this since 2009. This was a law that we got a lot of hate from animal advocates saying, I can't believe you think, you know, tethering 24 hours a day is okay. Um, and then once we explained it to them and said, we are giving basic protections. And as Ashley said, you know, you can strengthen it, but then also the hate from the dog fighters from throughout the United States, because we were the first state to ban um, chaining as a method of restraint. And that's, and that's something that they need to ensure that these animals are game, if you will. Yep. Yeah. Well, I got, I got a hate letter in um, Arabic. <laughs> from a dog fighter? Yeah, from California. Did, did it I have actually, a return address on it? <laughs> no, I had it translated. I was like, wow, this level of hate is kind of terrifying. <laughs> Before anyway. we switch, I, I really want to talk to you about uh, our next topic because I'm really, I'm really, really, really excited about it. But I also want to tease something at the end of the show that I maybe... Maybe we can work on it and start it in Texas because we know everything's bigger in Texas and then we can take it national. And I talked about it in our last episode, so don't give it away yet, ladies. Um, but I, the more and more I think about it, I think it's more realistic. And I think you can maybe if if it's something that we can work. I don't know how I work on it being in California and you in Texas, but you know what? We can do it there's ways that we can do it. And I, I just, I'm really excited about the idea. Um, so we'll get back to that. I just wanted to get it out there because it's called a tease in radio and don't go away because it's, it's a really interesting topic. And I really, from your perspective, having the attorney background, I really would love your insight. Uh, Cause you might say, Daniel, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Don't <laughs> ever bring it up to anybody again. Or you may say like, hmm, that's actually, that, that could work. So stay tuned for that. Where we're going now, which is really important, is for let me. I'm going to ask this to the bishops really quick. Have either of you been to or had a call where you're like, "Man, I wish I could have run hot to," or "We should be the first responder somewhere in that aspect." And if so, please share that story with the rest of the group. We are the first responders. What are you talking about? We're, we're talking usually the first ones on scene. Are you though? <laughs> No, sometimes. Talk about it. I, there was one that, um, it was a dog that was, I think we had a dog that was, if I remember correctly, poisoned. Okay. And the, it was out of vet clinic, but the vet clinic was of course closing because it's not a 24 hour clinic and the dog needed to get to the emergency clinic. Um, and the owners, you know, because of the condition of the dog, they didn't want to just put the animal in the owner's vehicle. And they also figured, you know, I could probably get, I literally actually asked for officers to see if anybody could, I could follow anybody running code and they would not allow it. Um, but this dog like needed immediate care, mm -hmm. um, I may or may not have done the speed limit. That's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> we, all um, we all been there. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I got the dog out there as fast as I could, but I definitely, that was one where just because of the circumstances, I can't even remember all of them. Um, but it definitely needed to get out to the emergency clinic, like right then. So that's definitely one. I see you thinking Ashley? ARV. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't personally had anything like this. You know, uh, I know my tenure officer, my assistant supervisor, I'm sure has, you know, I've heard a lot of stories of, you know, things like dogs hanging from chains and over the mm -hmm. fence lines and things like that. So in, in those situations, obviously, you know, a lot of times we need to go hot into those certain things because if for lack of better terms, you know, who else is going to be able to deal with an animal who doesn't know what's going on, could possibly bite. Last thing we need is for somebody to shoot the dog because they think it's being aggressive or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's something that we definitely could use as um, a tool for us to get to places and help people help animals. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, there was a, 
a lot of mine, I think, are a little bit more medical related. Um, we actually had a situation, officers went in to do a warrant. They told the people repeatedly, like, hey, put the dog away, put the dog away. And they didn't. Mm. And as people went running to the back of the house, when one officer was able to make it in, um, second officer, like, dog charged them. And so because nobody knew what was going on in that house, you know, was somebody going back to get weapons, whatever, um, that that dog ended up shot because they didn't have, you know, they, they had to keep everybody safe in that situation. And again, I got called in. And so to be able to have run code, dog survived. Um, but that's another case where I can just see like, um, you know, the benefits of it. In my years, all my years being on the road doing patrol for ACO work, I can't tell you the amount of times that I would get a call for from PD, like, can you have the ACO step it up? Like, step what up? What am I going to step <laughs> yeah. up? My amber lights? Right. Am I gonna, <laughs> my, hold on. Am I going to grab the steering wheel and do Jim Carrey and stick my head out the window? Like, <laughs> woo, woo, woo. like no, like, that's when you need a dog to help bark out the window for you step, step what up why don't y'all step up your appreciation for us and get us some red and blue lights and some sirens so yeah. shelby please let us know what you guys are working on there in texas about first responders so we uh a couple months back had been just surveying some animal control officers and shelter managers and saying what if we tried next session to um, help pass a law where ACOs are considered um, and or deemed first responders under Texas law. And so we thought it was incredibly important to try to just survey this and see where it went. And the amount of responses we received from people, um, particularly in the field, it was phenomenal. Like we've never had people come um, and respond in this way. And so in Texas, we have, I think Taka says 1,350 officers. And at the end of the day, I mean, you all are on the front line of protecting communities, addressing public health, um, spread of rabies, dangerous dogs. I can't think of a better definition of first responder. And really your role has dramatically expanded now, as you know, um, you provide community support and outreach, you investigate animal cruelty and neglect, uh, and you save animals. And so why are you not listed as first responders? Uh, as Ashley talked about earlier, our weather now in Texas is bananas. One day you can, I think we just had earthquakes <laughs> in West Texas yesterday morning. Before that, we had um, barrel we had Storm Yuri. I mean, you know, and guess what? ACOs are there all night. They are, you know, they can't go home. Some of them can't go have a beer with their friends because they got to be on call. So why are we not treating them like first responders? I will tell you. So after a couple of months of looking into this, we found the place um, in the Texas law that we would change. But we are hearing feedback from lawmakers that they really need this push to come from TACA itself and not THLN, which we're known as because, you know, I know this is hard to believe, but we are seen as an animal rights organization, um, liberal agenda, and we really need this to come from the ACOs themselves. So we've been having these great meetings behind the scenes and getting the shelter managers to go to their cities and talk to them about this. Um, we have a bill draft and everything. So that's kind of where we are on it. Neat. That's, that's good to hear, you know, and, and, and I'm lucky enough in the city that I work for um, my chain of command, which also includes a city manager. Um, they, they regard us in that sense. You know, when COVID happened, we were essential personnel uh, and we were able to do what we needed to do and everything like that. So I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, so I think this is going to help, you know, us get pushed forward because again, too, a lot of times, you know, people don't realize, you know, we're out there in all hours of the night. I know we had tornadoes uh, here locally 
Yeah. Um, and my, this was before I had started with the city I'm at and my assistant supervisor, you know, told me about everything that they had to go out and do, you know, they were out at all hours of the night, they were out doing rescues in, in high water situations, you know, so, you know, people don't really realize what we are tasked to do all the time in the field. Um, and unfortunately we're not really respected like the rest. Yes. And that's what frustrates us the most. You know, in Leveland, Texas, we had two uh, animal control officers, Crystal Goforth and John Porter. Uh, they were uh, killed when they were trying to assist with a dog that had been deceased on the side of the road. And I'm going to be very honest. I was frustrated how little attention was given to it. Um, there was a recent shooting uh, just south of Dallas a year ago. Yep. And two, it was two sheriff's deputies and an animal control officer. And the animal control officer was severely wounded, no mention of it by the governor's office. And so we we do feel by this elevation and status, so to speak, it will actually elevate the profession altogether. Hopefully um, we can get some better funding for our ACOs and, and our shelters. So we just, we think it's a feel good bill. But again, it's got to come from within the community because sometimes having our organization attached, it can be seen as animal rightsy. And uh, right. this this is not at all that, but we don't also want to harm the bill as well. I hope that with that also comes some additional training too. Um, you know, as if we're first responders and um going out with law enforcement into some volatile situations, having things like DAT training. So some hands, hands to hand combat. Um, I was actually asked to participate in a um, warrant. No, it wasn't even a warrant attempt. It was a, it was an eviction is what it was. They knew that there were animals in the house. They knew that the party inside the house was not going to go willingly. Um, and they'd been given plenty enough notice to get in. So when they breached the door, uh, or get out rather, um, when they breached the door, they actually had me in the lineup so that, you know, the dog, I could capture the dog right away and make sure the dog wasn't going to cause problems. Because we all know how, you know, animals react to their owners having a heightened emotion. Um, and I had absolutely no problem doing that. But then when I turned around and I asked, I said, you know, this is something where I absolutely have no problem being in line, but I want training on it. You know, I want to know where you want me standing, what you want me doing. Okay. I, you know, do I just hold the front door while the rest of you guys clear the rooms? Like, what do we do? And then it became this whole thing of, well, no insurance and blah, blah, blah. And you, you're not qualified. And but why? <laughs> why can't I be, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of training that could absolutely go along with it, but it's stuff that we absolutely should be having. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, you guys are already first responders. I mean, the, the responses, I just put an email out there, send examples of how you are already acting as first responders. And it was, again, overwhelming. I mean, from, yeah, they call, the police calls me to go ahead and remove two dogs from a house that have been, um, you know, protecting their deceased owner. Who's the first in? Well, you're a first responder then, if you're first. Always, right? always, um, always. You know, Ethel Strother with Taka, she tells me the great story of how SWAT called her and mm -hmm. said, um, well, we want to kill these 10 dogs that are protecting these dog houses because um, they have cocaine um, uh -oh. attached to the top of their dog roofs. And she's like, I got it. You know, and she's this little bitty thing. And she went, got each dog by the catch pole, you know, <laughs> and they're like, they're vicious. We're ready to shoot them. And she's like, I got this. So mm -hmm. I mean, you, you just have so many examples of why they're already acting as first responders. So let's give them their due. And I want to read something really quick to you from NACA. Yes. And it's, uh, uh, some people feel like NACA doesn't, um, doesn't put out position statements that are relevant to our field. I'll be honest, this one is extremely relevant. 
and it was put out in 2020. And I, I wonder if it was maybe in response to uh, COVID. Uh, I'm not sure, but animal control officers should be considered first responders. And this is at NACANet.org. The National Animal Care and Control Association believes that all animal field service professionals, including animal control, animal protection, should be considered and treated as first responders. The Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management Systems define first responders as individuals who, in the early stages of an incident, are responsible for the prevention, wow, protection and preservation of life property, evidence, and the environment. Animal control officers and other animal field services professionals meet this definition. It's pretty clear, right? I mean, even if we consider the animals still as property, and we're going to get to that here in a, a little bit. I mean, we're doing that. We're protecting yeah. property. We're protecting lives. It was great. in. Uh, so I'm in Dallas and I serve as the chair of the shelter commission here in Dallas. And so when the animal control appreciation week came up, I just went straight to city council. I said, can we get a proclamation and bring, you know, our ACOs in? And she was like, sure, we've never done that before. And I thought, wow, that's really sad. Um, you know, and it was great because they came in, they got their certificates um, and it was at least just for that moment, um, a certain appreciation. That's kind of where this was born from. But, you know, animal control officers really have a voice at the Capitol, but they just don't know how to use it sometimes. And they really don't know if they can. Right. And so I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I'd love to kind of guide ACOs, at least in Texas, go check your other states, but how to effectively advocate for ACOs being first responders. And, you know, it's always check first, um, obviously with your chain of command, if you are going to use it as, you know, Shelby Baboski ACO for Dallas, but you can always use your voice individually. And, you know, Daniel, one of the worst bills that ever came up was in 2015. And it was ACOs were going to be charged with a misdemeanor. This bill was actually filed. They were going to be charged with a misdemeanor if there were open kennels. Um, and they bracketed it to certain cities that I think, you know, um, in which this organization felt like they had um, their live release rate wasn't good. And so they were bracketing into these cities. And I saw this bill and I was like, All right, who fought? Like, this is terrible. And so I tried to get at that time, you know, ACOs to call and say there are there is a myriad of problems with this, right? And several of them were like, oh, I can't get, I'm not allowed to. It's illegal for me to lobby, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 hold on a minute. That's that's not necessarily true. Um, you can always use your own voice as a private citizen, but also as long as you go up your chain of command and explain how bad this bill would be, you know, you most definitely, they need to hear your voice because the, the group that was bringing it, they were not ACOs. So- Oh, no surprise, no surprise there. And, yeah. and those same yeah. groups that'll bring that will be against having like a mandatory spay and neuter bill. So right. I just don't get it. I don't get it. I have to say anybody that has the ability to go like, go back 15 seconds from just now when Shelby was starting to talk about this, because you will see me, Dan and Ashley do the like German shepherd head tilt at the stupidity that was that <laughs> statement <laughs> and that bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that did not pass. Yeah. Wow. That's ridiculous. Yes. We, you know, that was one where we were happy. You know, we, again, stand side by side with our shelters. They are our biggest stakeholders. We love TACA. Um, we work very closely with them on good ideas for bills and bad ideas. And at the time, we knew that you know, we needed to stand up and say, no, this is a terrible, terrible idea. And juxtaposed to, gosh, I wonder why, you know, we can't find a shelter manager in Dallas or San Antonio when we when we treat people this way, you know, like misdemeanor. What? So anyways, yes. But that is a good example of how we do need to hear their voice because, you know, Shelby Bavosky from Dallas, who cares? Right. But, oh, 
you know, Ashley from Brian, she's been doing this for a certain amount of time. They're going to listen to her. And she's an award-winning ACO, by the way, and director oh. and all that Dan, stuff. Dan, leave her alone. Just Stop. saying. Just, I mean, if we're keeping it a buck Look at my here. face. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Shelby, speaking, this is a good segue into what I wanted to ask you about. So you could tell me this is a bad bill or maybe possibly with some work, it could be a good bill and you be honest, be critical. You're, okay. you're a litigator at heart, right? So you can, you can chew me up on the stand and spit me out as I hear all these things. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about all of the just things we want to do to help pets, help people and their animals, it's more and more relevant now prevalent maybe that we have to figure out a way to incentivize animal ownership okay and maybe taking the the property aspect out of it and make them sentient so here's where i'm going in this day and age a lot of people refer to their pets as i don't i can't say it somebody else can say it yeah, maybe. Ugh, both of them <sighs> i babies. <laughs> I respect it. <laughs> Shelby, what if? And and so part of the biggest problem is like we're overcrowded. We're not doing enough to ensure that our animals are spayed, neutered, vaccinated, uh, licensed, microchipped, all that stuff, responsible pet ownership. What if there was maybe it starts in a state and then it becomes a federal bill? I don't even know how you do this. But what if there was a, an allowance of up to maybe three pets per year, as long as we do these things, ensure that they're spayed, neutered, they're vaccinated, they have their license, they, they're microchipped, they are a tax write-off. So we always want to call them kids. So let's start fucking treating them as kids in that aspect. But we have to do those things. So every year, they have to have an exam through a veterinarian to ensure that they're still vaccinated, everything, their health certificate's good. And then at the end of the year, when we do our taxes, we can claim these animals. And, and maybe it's a small tax you know, credit mm -hmm. up, to, up to three animals a year, but now we are ensuring responsible pet ownership. We're getting animals spayed and neutered, and there's an incentive behind it, and it's federally backed. And then not only does it like change the perception like internally on how we see our animals, but now nationally animals are looked at differently because they are part, we know they're part of the family. We can't argue that anymore. So I'd love your take on that. I think it's brilliant. Um, I, this is the first time I've heard this idea. So I, I'm kind of like, it's percolating right now, but a um, couple of things. So in the state of Texas and beyond, mostly animals are deemed property, yep. especially in Texas. You know, the non-human rights project is really making huge strides about, you know, what rights do animals actually have? Um, and, you know, internationally, they are way ahead of us with Sandra, the orangutan in Argentina and some of these other places. Um, in state of Texas, Strickland v. Medland is a Supreme Court case. And basically, um, this dog was accidentally euthanized by a shelter, and that that was the the case that started it. But when it got to the Supreme Court, it was our animal's property. And there were some great examples of how, you know, if someone cuts down a tree in front of your house um, and it's been there for a hundred years, you get um, damages for that, right? If you had a wedding picture of your grandparents and it gets damaged in a flood, um, although that is property, you still get sentimental value. But really Strickland v. Medlin solidified that animals are deemed property. And, you know, we can buy or sell, we can trade our property. There's certain ways we have to treat them. I love this idea uh, federally, um, as long as you could stay away kind of from that property idea, because- mm -hmm. You know there are tax breaks all the time when it were when it um, relates to certain property. So I don't, I don't know. You might be onto something here, uh, um, Shelby. It's we. We might be onto something. Okay. <laughs> like an ag tax or something. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah, I like it. I I I need to. You know, a lot of people need to think it through. I will say this. You know, we helped with the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Um. And that took, you guys, common sense, right? Ownership of tigers, large carnivorous animals. 
Um, that took how many years? 12 our friend, years our friend, pass? our friend and former guest of the show was on a part of that, right? Carol Baskin. Was yeah. Part of that. Yeah. Yeah. But like common sense isn't as common anymore as Tim Harrison says, but you know, it's just federally, it's so hard to pass an animal law. Um, that's why we love working in Texas because we meet every two years and we've been really successful with it. But I think you're onto something. I like it. Um, you know, a couple of years back in Texas from this really um, this case that kind of bore this idea that rescue animals should be taxed. I don't know if you heard about this. Like the comptroller's office was actually back taxing animal rescues. And there was this one uh, boxer rescue out of North Texas that got back taxed $30,000. So we went into the legislature like that um, and fixed it. Not we, well, we supported it, but it came really from um, Katie Jarl and her lobbying team because it was ridiculous. Like, no, these aren't goods for sale. These are animals we're rescuing. Why would anyone, you know, be a part of that? So there is an appetite for that. I like it. Thank you. And I think the more... It it's multifaceted. It's not just about ensuring act, you know, adequate care and, and spay and neuter, but it shows how we value animals because yes. a lot of people do refer to them as for babies. <laughs> so <laughs> in order to really capture that, and actually I agree with it. Um, you know, pets are a, a very important part of the family. And actually one study is um more more kids will grow up with a pet in the household than a father in this country. So that's an awful uh, stat. I, it is, but it's a true stat. And so why are we <laughs> still treating them as we would in 1875? Like this is 2024. Uh, maybe I reach out to ALDF too. Like I, uh, some of the big legislators, like HSUS. I mean, they could they could definitely push it for well, help push it forward. They have those people that know how to like do that stuff. I'm just an idea person, and it came to me just through all these conversations we've been having about access to care and like we, we have to find ways to motivate people. And then unfortunately, sometimes we only can do that through their pocket. I mean, you guys, childless cat ladies, uh, Christy <laughs> Nome shooting her puppy. I mean, this stuff is really showing and demonstrating again, like we always say, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, as long as you believe in common sense, animal related laws, then, you know, why wouldn't you support this? And really animal issues are truly bipartisan, but yeah. you can see now a swarm of people that hear some of these things that people are saying, and it's really coming against them. And I haven't seen that uh, in a long time. So it is a very exciting time. And I think our attitudes are most definitely shifting. Um, it's just the policies that are being put in place sometimes that you got to be careful with. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Hmm. I have uh, a question, Dan. Yeah. Are you good with uh, kind of going off the beaten path? Please. This is, this is your show too, Bishop. So Shelby, I mean, I, I know y'all are kind of in the law aspect of things, but mm. I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts on the no-kill movement mm. and kind of, you know, where you see us, you know, especially because you're here in Texas and I'm sure you know, you know, what's going on in, in, in our world here and in all the major cities. What what are your thoughts on the no-kill movement? Ashley, <laughs> it's too early and I don't have alcohol in this. I have coffee. <laughs> Putting you on Please the spot, Shelby. <laughs> wow. No, um, gosh, this is, well, it's a loaded question, right? It is. And I will tell you, THLN's policy has always been, you know, show us a bill. And because, you know, we've really expanded 10 years ago, we were just focused on 10 years ago, <laughs> we had just gotten enough money for an executive director, right? We had been a bunch of volunteers for 50 years going to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know in 2011, there was a CAPA bill that was put forth in Texas, and it was really viewed as a Christmas tree bill. And it had a lot of things in there that we did not agree with. Um, and so our, our policy is always show us an ordinance or a bill or something, and we will opine on it. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a board of directors that is full of Texas animal law attorneys and experts. 
And I really lean on them, um, especially during the legislative session. With that being said, if there isn't a bill, um, we have seen some policies recently that really, uh, in our opinion, are not good ideas. Um, and that includes, for example, you know, this idea of giving citizens catch poles and trying to have them shelter um, animals and not be a part of really fostering. It's this whole idea of like, let's keep animals outside of shelters however we can. And to me, going back to the ordinances, you know, that's violating impoundment ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like I just think back to the 1800s where we didn't have shelters, right? Um, and so now it's like, you wouldn't go to a fire department and say, you guys aren't going to handle fires anymore. We're going to give our citizens hoses and buckets, right? Like, it's just, what, what are we doing here? So I have seen some ordinances out there and we have been asked by cities, well, this is what is being proposed by this national organization. What do you guys think? And we're just honest. We say, it's a terrible idea. I mean, look, our biggest thing, um, and we haven't talked about our legislative slate for 2025, but one of the things we're looking at is funding for rural shelters. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have several counties that are exploding in population, and we are fighting to get them money to create and um, create, sorry, build an animal shelter. So the idea of let's keep animals outside of shelters really is the antithesis of what we're trying to do because those counties have horrific dog bites, horrific mm. maulings, and those counties are seeing rabies again. Mm. Um, in We have 250 some counties. <laughs> rabies was found in a hundred counties in the last five years in Texas. That's terrifying. So, you know, we, we look at policies and we look at, okay, what would this ordinance say? But, you know, some of these shelters that are saying, please don't bring any dogs in, you know, try to try to do your own fostering. Um, that is something that we definitely are not in general. We'd have to look again at the specifics, but that's something we don't support. Shelby, all this time and energy these groups put into like finding these alternative means to not bring animals to the shelter. Why are they just not focusing on spay and neuter programs? Like through attrition, we get to that goal. Like I just, I don't understand it. It blows my mind. What Like they're misfocused Listen, or misguided. We could, we could not agree more. Okay. We should spay neuter them all. Right. Um, now I will say in Texas, and throughout, we know about this vet shortage. I mean, you guys, the state of Texas has two vet schools. Have you seen how big we are? And the other, the second vet school has not even graduated their first class. Um, you know, I will say Texas is, the reciprocity is very difficult to get to. So we are looking next session to try to help that um, mm -hmm. because there was a mandatory spay neuter bill that was brought last session in Texas. It, um, of course, AKC, uh, was gladly bragging about killing that bill, right? But we want to, if we're going to pass something like that, and and that would be like my dream uh, in retirement, but if we can wow. pass something like that, we have to set up it so it doesn't fail. And that means more spay-neuter um, clinics, vets, everything. Spay-neuter network, Daniel, all of those people, I try to give as much um like popularity and get their names out there because that I couldn't agree more. That is the key to everything is spay neuter. Um, and it's just, I, I don't know if it's not sexy. I don't know if the funding's there. I don't know if it's because it's not a, a catchphrase, but I agree with you a thousand percent. It's incredibly important. Sidebar, we do have a license plate program in Texas. Okay. We are one of the few and it's had, I think it's success at this point is 8 million in low cost spay neuters. The problem is it's become incredibly burdensome and we are looking at ways along with the rural funding to revamp that right now. It's got a dog and cat cartoon on it. It was 20 years ago and it says animal friendly. A lot of people are like, what does that mean? So we want to say on the license plate, spay and neuter your pets. Yeah. Um, so we're, Thank we're you, Bob Barker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and really quick. Um, we are very excited to announce in the upcoming month a Texas-based spay-neuter website. So many people are like, I need to spay-neuter my pet. I don't know where to go. So that is in the works. We're working on it. We're very excited to launch that sometime in the future. 
you're 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 a man after my own heart. Let me tell you, spade well, eater is key. Yeah, I mean, are you going to be at the fiftieth year TACA conference? Yes, yes, well, we, we will be there. We can chat more uh, there and just yeah. discuss some of these things. I think sometimes people lose sight of the fact that you said this earlier. Shelby was like, we do have a voice and we can push things uh, up the flagpole, if you will. And and I'm, you know, I'm encouraged by the by all the people doing the great work out here. And it's it's really trying to unify us into figuring out ways to make this more, I guess, um, like more obtainable. If we're here to help animals, I mean, and, and I, I often say you have to help people help animals. And the reason I'm so, I guess, on that, on that phrase is, to be honest, there are people out there that aren't animal people. And so when you can relate it to them, that it also helps people, uh, then they get, they get the buy-in too. And so I think that's really important that we're not just focusing on the animal piece, you know, having, showing how it can affect the human aspect of it um, also will, will win support there. Uh, and so I think we have to just continue to, to push. And it sounds like you're doing some wonderful things in Texas. And sometimes, you know, when states like this that are so so big, they can be the catalyst for other states. And and that's what we need. We need someone to champion these ideas. And it sounds like you're doing it there. So we we applaud you here on the animal control report. Thank you. We we hope we're doing good. And on that note, you nailed it. Um, Liberty County, a hundred thousand people, they have no county shelter, and they have two cities with basically um, I think a total of 20 kennels. 100,000 people. The dog bites are insane. Rabies has been um, suspected there on two separate occasions. Suspected, sorry, it's it was there. And, you know, now we have to get ER doctors to come in and say, we need professional animal control, um, you know, uh, shelters. We need managers. We need to get them out there. And, you know, that is a people problem, 1,000%. So you nailed it. Yeah. Bishops, any final moves? I'm going to start saying that because, you know, the diagonal moves. We're, we're, we're Bishops are now. great. They're, I mean, they are a great chess piece. I, I I don't know. A queen is probably my favorite and should be your favorite. Um, but Bishop is, is up there. It's like a top three piece, I think. You have <laughs> the queen is number one. She's always number one. I don't really care about the king. Sure, like you have to protect him at all costs. But she, the queen, is just, she's the queen. Like she just protects everything. And then um, the horse is, is just fun because you can just jump and move. But the bishop, it's, it's yeah, the bishop is where it's at. I have no, I have no, I've, I've never played chess in my life. Well, you will. Or you're playing chess right now <laughs> with animal control stuff. Do you have any final <laughs> thoughts, y'all? Anything? Nothing no. other. I was just going to say, Thank you, Shelby, for coming mm -hmm. on, talking about everything that you did. I think I'm I'm hoping it kind of opens up um, some thoughts to some of our listeners. Um, there's no need to ever reinvent the wheel if somebody has done it before you. So, you know, some of the laws that Texas has, definitely check them out and see if you can uh, implement them. You might have to tweak them a little bit just to fit your situation, but no reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, so that I plan on bringing your, um, Heathering. what was it technically called? The, un, the, I've got unchained Wisconsin in my head now because that's what the group was. Yeah. Safe outdoor dogs act. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to bring that up and see if yeah. we can do something with that. Excellent. Happy to help. Yeah. I think for me, you know, thank you for all the work Shelby. And I, I appreciate, you know, the respect that you give our, our profession as somebody in your stature, you know, um, I think it's, it, it, it's amazing. You know, I, I know from, I'm not going to say that, but <laughs> I think, you know, 
uh, as Dan said is before, you know, in a lot of our previous podcasts, you know, it's just about letting people know that our profession matters um, and that there are very well educated people in our profession. You know, I mean, we get asked by, you know, MDs all the time. Well, what is rabies protocol? Oh, we have to do that. Or do we have to do that? Or it, it amazes me how somebody who goes through that much schooling has no idea or clue about one of the most deadliest viruses on this planet. Yep. Um so, you know, th there's a need for people like us um, in the field, in our profession, doing what we do on a daily basis. And I, I appreciate you and your support that you give our profession overall. Um, it it's it's truly heartwarming. We we appreciate you more than you'll ever know. And, you know, I will always stand by animal control officers because your job is incredibly, incredibly difficult from from various aspects. And so we are here for you. And if anybody is watching this and they're in Texas and they want to know um, how they can approach their own city councils right now to get the ACO as first responder on their legislative agendas, please reach out to info at thln.org. And also our uh, we have a very simple 30 minute Zoom on how to do it as well. But we're, we really want to help get this um, through. We're very excited about it. That's awesome. Also, just final thoughts. You know, it pumped it, pumped it to my head, how we could track this whole idea of, I, I can't get off this idea of this federal tax thing. But like, <laughs> because you have to microchip, that's basically the social security number for a pet. So you put that in there and then they can track it through that to make sure you're doing all the things. So anyway, I'll stop because I'll keep talking about it if you let me. Thank you again, Shelby, for taking your time to to do Thank this you. show. We we loved having you. You're always welcome back as we we say that to only the guests that we want to have back. So don't feel like we say it to every guest. <laughs> to every guest. But <laughs> we really, because we have great guests, though. Oh, we always have great guests. So uh, we would love to we would love to uh chat again and it'd be great to see you in uh San Antonio or San Antonio. I'll be there next week or so, actually. Anyway, for, for what? Um, there's a family advocacy uh, training. It's part of the military, and I do some training for them about the link between animal cruelty and domestic violence. Mm. Um, so it's just right outside the airport. I'll probably go to mm. the top of the tower and uh, just look around and say, like, wow, it's really flat here, but it's beautiful. So. <laughs> <laughs> Also, please check out the website, keepinghumane.com. Please, please, please like, share, rate, do all that stuff because that helps the podcast. And stay tuned. I have some giveaways that I think I'm going to do on social media. They're pretty cool. I found them when I was unpacking. I was like, oh, I have all this stuff. I should give it away. So we're going to give some stuff away. So stay tuned for that. And thanks for listening and continue to help people, help, help. animals. Oh, yeah. And keep it humane. <laughs>